Okay. Um, so I will um, talk about um, some introduction of lattice quantum chromodynamics. So these, um, I don't see actually too many students. Um, so I will give a little bit introduction. So um, I think uh, there are many experts here. So ex expert uh, can go to sleep. Um, so I will um, introduce first a uh, bit about quantum chromodynamics, and uh, then I will talk about um, some introduction to lattice QCD um, with uh, scalar theory, then uh, gauge action, Fermion action. Uh, then I will talk about how to calculate an observables. Um, and I will show lots of results on um, some prominent results on the that uh, throughout the last 40 years people have um, obtained uh, some prominent results and then I will discuss some of the challenges and what type of computers we use. So, uh, some part of the talks uh, basically for the people who are not um, engaged in lattice calculation just to show that um, uh, lattice people are doing some um, uh, good work on the uh, current um, and model some some of the calculations. Okay, so let's uh, go to this. Uh, so this is our QCD action. So this is from we'll check some uh, article. I just copied it from there. Uh, we have um, quarks and then gluons. I, I hope that everybody knows um, about it pretty well. So um, he wrote it. That's it. Uh, but uh, the next there is an interesting thing he has wrote written down, but in principle, it leads to equations that are notoriously hard to solve. So, um, actually, very hard to solve in um, hadronic scales, um, and that's why um, we need some type of regulator that can help to um, calculate um, observables, um, and uh, that's why the lattice QCD is needed. All right, so QCD, going back to QCD again, so what's the properties of QCDs? Uh, the strong interaction are confining, asymptotically free, and they're chirally broken. And these three gentlemen, um, they have shown that it's asymptotically free, and this is the coupling constant that uh, most of you know very well. Um, and these are the data points, and these are the uh, theoretical uh, next to next to next flipping order cal calculation. And this is from April 2016. So um, it looks like uh, it's pretty impressive that we can um, get the reality uh, very well. And it is a SU3 component of the SU3 cross SU2 cross E1 standard model. So this is SU3 component. And uh, so as, as I was mentioning, to study the physics in the hadronic scales, the perturbative methods, they fail. You can think about that proton mass. The proton mass is um, 1 GeV. And if you add up the uh, quark masses, this is just 1-2%. Uh, um, and most of the coming out from the uh, non perturbative interactions of a gluon. So you, the perturbative methods fails. So we need a different type of regulator. And uh, if we put a different regulators, uh, so we need to have a good measure. Uh, and then it should regularize momentum, like uh, it should have a, a good uh, ultraviolet uh, cutoff, which should have a, um, uh, IR uh, properties also good. Uh, so lattice can do both. So I will show how it can do both and how it can regulate the theory and then um, calculate the QCD properties. Okay, uh, coming uh, back to QCD again. So if you want to introduce the QCD on the lattice, then uh, you have to um, see what are the properties of QCD. There are symmetries you have to preserve. The symmetries, it has the SU3 local gauge symmetry and the Lorentz symmetry, um, charge conjugation parity, a time reversal and the global flavor symmetry. So we have to preserve those on the lattice if you want to put this theory on the lattice. And it had uh, E1 symmetry and then you, 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 um, on the chiral limit, it has the chiral symmetry. Um, so these, all of them has to preserve on the lattice. I mean, uh, that's the goal. And um, we have fundamental parameters at the gauge coupling, which is dimensionless, and the quark masses, which is a dimension full. Um, so we shouldn't get a theory where um, we have lots of parameters. Uh, so lattice should not introduce more free parameters. So that's, um, we have to keep that in mind. Okay. Now, uh, what is the goal? You have seen these uh, lots of particles. You don't read anything. There are lots of particles in the um, particle data group, uh, the baryons and mesons. So we, uh, the goal is we want to study the uh, masses of these particles, inter their interaction, their properties, their decay, 
And let's see how many, um, or if we can at least get something out of that um, lattice regularization and calculate the properties of various particles. So um, that's the uh, primary goal, but there are other, many other goals. And I will concentrate some of these here. Okay. Uh, so, our, so let's say we have a theory and we put an Euclidean formulation, but why do you go to the Euclidean formulation? The, the reason, main reason is that uh, if you do in the Minkowski space, um, our integral um, can have a I factor, and if we want to simulate that on the, uh, let's say, in the computer, then uh, these factor will create trouble. You will not be able to uh, do um, numerical calculation because of this phase. Uh, so you go to the Euclidean space, and then got rid of uh, that factor, and it is like you can um, minus factor comes, and immediately you can see that uh, you can associate uh, the observables, like for example some Green's function, you can associate with a statistical mechanical some type of correlation function. So uh, Green's function of a field theory, uh, you can associate with the correlation function of the corresponding statistical system. And if you cal can calculate the correlation function, like say equal time correlation function or some correlation function, then we can get the spectrum of the theory. It is, uh, we, in that respect, um, QCD is good that it has a mass gap, so you will be able to get, um, um, you, you will be able to calculate good way the correlation function and um, uh, you, you can formulate like this type of um, uh, correlation function, then you will be able to calculate it. And the matrix element also, like for example, let's say we want to study the B to D transition, and then uh, these could be also formulated in terms of this path integral. <coughs> so uh, the tr trick is that you do the calculation in the Euclidean space and go back to the min space at the end, uh, if possible. Uh, but then many physical quantities like mass, matrix element, they do not need to rotate it back. Uh, so in that respect, it will be good um, because you will calculate the equal time correlation function there. Uh, but there will be problem for the scattering problem. Uh, uh, it's not possible to do Euclidean formulation, but uh, you will be able to do using some trick, and people have done that. So, uh, before going to the uh, QCD, let's, uh, because the students are here, so I will um, show that uh, using a scalar field theory, so you will be able to formulate um, on the lattice and then calculate some of the parameters. Okay, so this is our. Uh, Continuum uh, Euclidean action for the scalar field theory. Um, so this action is there. Um, I think every of you knows about it. And so we want to put that theory on the lattice. We put, uh, discretize it. So discretize phi goes to phi n. Uh, so for the student, actually, uh, you'll try to do this thing, I think, um, by your own. And then um, maybe today, tomorrow, sometimes you can um, uh, talk with me or anybody else that how to put this, in, this theory on the lattice. <coughs> So let's say phi is the field, so you discretize it at each space-time point, phi n, and x is the coordinate, um, in the total lattice, uh, x, x1, x2, x2, like that. And uh, you can uh, put the, uh, your integral like a summation, and you can put the measure also, some, uh, some type of this type of uh, sum over all the uh, lattice points. And then you have to uh, take the derivatives. So derivatives, um, here you have to be careful how to take the derivatives. And so let's say this phi field can be um, taken difference between two uh, lattice points, but you have to do such a way that the action became also a positive definite, um, so that all type of derivatives are not allowed. Um, and you have to preserve the symmetries on the, uh, the action. So after doing this derivative, uh, you can put that, um, uh, so this will be your lattice version of the action. Uh, so this action you can put on, the, uh, on a computer and can simulate it. So it, uh, but one thing you, you have seen it, uh, the momentum got regularized, so I will show you why. So if you go to um, momentum space, uh, momentum space, the momentum is like, for example, if this is a Fourier transformation, so this is your uh, Fourier field, and uh, because of the lattice points, so of each lattice point, so there will be brilliant zone, and uh, momentum got um, like periodic, so this is a momentum, and plus this is the, uh, periodic momentum and n is the number. Uh, so you can uh, think about the momentum is like this, this is called discretized and there is a maximum momentum is possible, the 2 pi over n by L, the L depending on the lattice spacing and the lattice size. So this is the <coughs> maximum momentum and these allowed you to regularize the theory, the ultraviolet, uh, you just got rid of all the higher momentum 
and you can regularize it very natural way. So that's the reason Lattice can provide a uh, very natural way um, the ultraviolet cutoff. And that's very good. Uh, so you don't have to uh, worry about um, higher momentum. And then your measure you can write down like this way in the integral. Um, and another property is that you can um, tune the mass in such a way that is much, much less than one, and momentum also is less than one over A. So that means in the IR properties, the infrared properties, you can also um, could be fine. Um, so you have to be careful about how, what to the lattice spacing, where, where it is actually giving you physical theory or not. So, so the conclusion is that the lattice can provide a natural regulator for field theories. And uh, at the end, we have to take the continuum limits. The continuum limit I will talk a little bit later, a little bit more. Um, so the time axis, the total L and T that should be going to infinity, that the uh, thermodynamic limit, lattice spacing also goes to zero. Uh, so in that, you will get back the scalar theory. Uh, I think um, I will tell, uh, encourage student to formulate this thing. Uh, just go through um, by yourself and formulate it. And maybe we can help uh, to put on the lattice and see how it goes um, So during this workshop. All right, so this is for the scalar field theory as an example. Um, but now our goal is go to the, uh, go to solve QCD. And is that possible? Um, so in this paper, and uh, 1974, Wilson showed that, yes, it is possible. Uh, now you can show that the quarks are confining. Um, so there is a mass gap. Um, and uh, this is a very uh, well-known paper. Uh, so I will we'll follow that one. So let's see, uh, now we are going to the QCD. And we have to see uh, the you know, gauge field theory how um, this formulation can be done. So his prescription is the, uh, uh, are the quarks fields are lie on the lattice sides. So the, these are the quarks fields, and they're connected by gluon links. So what are the links here? Links actually. So these are the gauge fields, and he instead of gauge field, he used the parallel transporter. The parallel transporter between the uh, two lattice sides. For example, from this point to this point, so you can write down um, a parallel transporter from your original gauge field, like defining this way. This is like path order product um, of um, some Wilson loops. So you will be able to get, uh, you, you will be able to define some type of, uh, some another variable, um, these U links. And uh, is your fields also get transformed. So the, let's say V and are the para, are the parameters of the sorry, they are the elements of the SU3, uh, the SU3 matrices, and then psi n will be transformed like the V and psi n and psi bar n also similar way. And you can show that the psi bar and psi n, if you transform like this way, the um, things will be gauge invariant. Any op uh, many operators you can write down this way, so th those will be gauge invariant. And uh, the links they transform itself like this type of. Um, um, they, uh, they follow this type of gauge transformation. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, you will be able to write down um, your discretized action uh, with these variables. And that can um, help you to uh, put a, um, a gauge, gauge action you can write down in terms of these vari variables. So we'll show how to do that. And now uh, the derivatives also, you have to be careful how to do the derivatives. Again, you have to preserve symmetries and uh, you have to see that whether uh, they are, um, reflection positive or not. So the deriv derivative has to be done carefully. And at the end, uh, you'll be able to write down um, the gauge action in terms of some variables. We'll discuss a little bit more, uh, some type of gauge invariant objects. And these objects, he has shown that, uh, for example, uh, he, has, he has shown that uh, if you write down a plaquette like things, so the plaquette definition is that you just tie them all and come back to the original position. So these are all the gauge link put them all together, and each link um, is SU3 matrices, and then if you take a trace of that, so that is a gauge invariant object, and this will be a plaquette, and with that, one can write down a uh, gauge action. Uh, now, now the question is whether that will be your QCD action or not, but one can try to various type of these type of um, loops um, with the gauge invariant object and see which goes to the uh, in the continuum limit, which goes to the QCD action. More on the gauge invariant action. I think these, um, I will encourage students to show that these actually give you the QCD action. So I will just briefly sketch. Um, so this is your <coughs> plaquette. And now you can expand. So remember the U's are, these are the U. Now you can expand 1 plus IA. Um, uh, 
one minus i a and you dagger that way and then you can put that and then you go to the next uh, so first order is one second order one plus i a if we just expand you put it here and you will be able to get like this now in the next order um, because this order um, is cancelled in order of a so you go to the next order the so next order is this plus there will be more terms um, so next order in a square so there will be more, more term and at the end you will be able to show that this is um, like your placket is like this um, so again i'm telling the students that um, you should try to cal do this thing by yourself and you will be able to do it uh, for sure and then um, since there is a square term uh, you have to make the unitary the plaque at the uh, end you want that it will be unitary so you will put the um, f square term after that uh, so you put the f square term and uh, then take the trace if you take the trace at uh, and put the all the lattice point together you will be able to show you will be able to show that this goes to uh, your continuum action continuum gauge action so wilson wrote with this placket uh, first time that wilson uh, gauge action uh, so this is the wilson gauge action and um, the beta is here uh, related to the coupling and this is related to one of our coupling square so put that way and so this is called the wilson gauge action uh, remember this discretization is not um, unique you can put lots of other placket uh, so this is the simplest one uh, with one placket, you can add up many more, many more placket in uh, uh, complicated placket in sub, uh, inside that is. And uh, for example, this is an one type of um, improved um, lattice, uh, sorry, improved gauge action with uh, one by two boxes. For example, you can put more placket here. And but you'll be able to show this also goes to the continuum limit faster than this. Okay, so this is the gauge action, and uh, we can uh, the students should do that, and will be uh, any of us expert here will be able to um, help them uh, to get that. Okay, now um, I talked about the continuum limit. So after, I mean, I'm going pretty fast because I will also discuss some of the results. So that's why, um, but uh, I'm just going to show you the, some glimpses like what we followed. Uh, no one can show that. Lattice spacing, uh, if you, if you um, calculate the beta function relation um, on the lattice, you will be able to show that the lattice spacing actually the dynamically the generate, the regularization generate a scale. And that scale could be the lambda parameter scale. Um, it, it generates automatically. That's quite interesting to see that. So there's a mass gap um, automatically can generate uh, with this lattice regularization. And continuum limit here means that lattice spacing tends to zero that we know. So G square tends to zero. Um, and this is the lattice observable, let's say m lat, the mass of a particle, let's say m lat at coupling G A, which is related to the physical mass, and that will go to zero at the continuum limit. So the correlation length, which is inverse lattice spacing, that should go to infinity. So that means the continuum limit of the lattice theory can be obtained by tuning the bare parameters, like let's say m lat, the bare parameters to the critical surface because xi uh, is going to the infinity critical surface of the lattice system. The theory, that means theory is defined on the um, critical point or the critical surface um, of um, the continuum theory. Uh, so uh, now the question is how do you tune these parameters? So you have to, uh, the parameters are, let's say this g is there, so that is related to a, so you have to tune that a and this m is there, the bare parameters, so you have to tune those. So you have to get rid of some of, uh, uh, in order to tune that, you have to um, follow some procedures. For example, you can use um, some physical quantities, uh, the masses um, or string tension or something, uh, you just uh, tune those in terms of those and uh, uh, get the values of A and M lat. And once you get that one, so remember this will be in the critical um, surface. Once you get that, uh, then all other QCD observable can be predicted. Um, so that's the theory is telling, but whether that is possible or not, so we can see that. So um, you tune those parameters, so the, and we are not introducing any more parameter that we um, actually demanded that we will not introduce any more parameter. The parameters only are lattice spacing and uh, masses of the particles. Okay, now, sorry. This, this is like the, you can expand um, in terms of beta uh, these uh, general group equation from there is coming. 
Okay, these are the uh, gauge action. Now we have to um, talk about the fermion action. So on the lattice, the fermion action, so let's say these are observable, and we wrote that in terms of the partition function, like this way, these are the observable, and these are in terms of the path integral. Uh, now, the funny thing is that um, these fermion are actually Grassmann variable, and you can write your fermion action like this way. So this is your fermion field, and these are matrix, um, and uh, so this is a, you can write down like a uh, Gaussian thing, and then you can integrate them out, and it will be determinant. So we got the determinant. So we are not, um, I mean, like the gauge action, we are not doing that way. So we are integrating it out. So psi field got away, and so you will be able to um, get a partition function in terms of the only the uh, uh, gauge field. But the, of course, the gauge fields are there. Uh, the fermion fields are also there. So you will be able to get uh, the, because of the Grassmann variable, you will be able to get rid of. Um, this is the integration. Now, um, remember you have to write down, so you want to show that how to discretize this um, psi action uh, for the fermion. But remember you have to do, uh, um, again, some symmetries you have to preserve, like the translational symmetry. So this will be discrete translational symmetry. And um, this will be fine. I mean, some limit, it may create problem in the infrared, but uh, as long as momentum is not, uh, uh, momentum is less than one over A, so it will be fine. Then the chiral symmetry, um, I think in, the, in this conference we'll um, heard a lot of about that. So chiral symmetry in the continuum is like the, uh, the d gamma of i equal to zero. We can write down d like this way. And then the locality. Locality is uh, like is a dp is a regular uh, function of p throughout the each brillia zone. Um, so these things you have to preserve while you uh, discretize the Fermion action. Okay, let's do... Um, step by step, the Fermion action, uh, let's uh, think about the simplest one. So we write down psi bar, psi, and this is a T, um, and uh, this is your mass term. And if you just uh, do the uh, perturbation calculation, you can show that, uh, um, you will be able to show that this is like a, your uh, Fermion action you can write down, and this is, will be like a propagator. Uh, but one thing has to be remembered that you, why do you put that way? Um, gamma mu d mu, you have to write down like this, like this way, not just one, but the backward forward, otherwise it will not be um, uh, reflection positive. Um, then uh, continuum to discrete, so we got a uh, momentum here, one over a, so this is your uh, p mu now, the con so continuum momentum with p mu, uh, we got a discrete momentum like that. And if you calculate the propagator from here to here, and uh, the students here actually uh, we encourage them to do this calculation, they'll be able to derive this one, is um, not difficult. Um, and we'll, we'll see that the propagator becomes like this. Uh, so it is mass plus the, this term. And uh, so PMU is basically this one. Now, if you plot this thing, um, it will be weird because um, now you have. Uh, is very different because the moment, uh, uh, momentum is like this. It will be very different than the continuum momentum. So dispersion relation in the continuum was like that. Because of the lattice, we came like this. So um, you, you want um, like the zeros, the propagator, the pole are, uh, you want only at zeros, but now the pole will be at here, here, and if it's four dimensional lattice, so there will be two to the power D, uh, so 16 poles. You know the poles are the masses. So that means we are getting the uh, 16, uh, instead of one fermion, we are getting the 16 fermion. Um, so we don't want that theory. Uh, so that, that problem is called the fermion doubling problem. So we, by naive discretization, we uh, aim a, uh, I mean, a massive problem that uh, this is the discretization. So this is a, lots of fermions are coming. So we need this dispersal relation like that, but we are getting like that. So if you can get it up, let's say we can lift this thing higher then it will be able to um, say something that, okay, these are the massive fermion, let's get, get this thing here. Uh, so they will not contribute to the theory. Um, actually, so that, that is one type of discretization. Um, there are lots of other type of discretization that uh, can try to solve um, this problem. So we'll discuss gradually. Okay, uh, so here there is a theorem um, came out that uh, it was done earlier that um, you cannot write down a uh, action like which has all the properties like dx is local. A uh, local means it is uh, decaying very fast. Let's say this is more than exponentially, and then it is uh, it has a hypercubic symmetry on um, the no doubler. The dp is invertible um, and the chiral symmetry. They showed that it is not possible even in the continuum to um, 
generate a theory um, a, a, a action which preserve all of these. So that is, there is no doubler free chiral symmetric translational invariant real valued lattice action. So that's uh, the Fermion action is a problem. So what should we do? So Wilson came out with this idea that uh, the lift those corner um, fermion. See, so introduce a term, uh, this term. Uh, see that uh, there is you no know, gamma mu in between. So gamma mu um, psi bar um, psi, and this term is going. So between psi bar and psi, there is you no know, gamma mu. So that means this term will explicitly break the chiral symmetry. You will not be able to write on the chiral um, wild fermion in this format also. So this is the Wilson term. So the Wilson term is like a scalar kinetic term. It lifts the doubler, um, and um, it, uh, it is order of a irrelevant operator because it's dimension five operator, um, and uh, so that's a problem. And so because it will introduce, um, if, if you, when you go to the continuum limit, so that will give a, your mass will be additive with that. So this term will additive with that, and the additive mass renormalization will be. So you will not be able to go to the continuum limit at all, um, even in the chiral limit. Uh, sorry, you will not be able to go to the chiral limit at all. Uh, so it breaks chiral symmetry. Um, so we got rid of the um, uh, doubler. So doublers got a little bit massive, um, but the, with the price that it breaks the chiral symmetry. So uh, if you just rescale a um, little bit psi, so you will be able to show that this is the Wilson action and uh, early stage of lattice gas theory. Um, most of the people use, I mean, many people use used to do calculation through this action without forgetting, um, sorry, forget, uh, forgetting the chiral symmetry. So this is the Wilson fermion um, on the lattice. <clears throat> then there is another called staggered fermion. So staggered fermion is, um, so remember we have 16 fermion. Now um, one can show that these 16 fermion can be written down in a spin block diagonal way and the four blocks and um, you can write down just your fermion field psi and like this type of some other variable psi prime n. So this is your new field with some gamma matrices. And these gamma matrices, you can transform each to other, uh, the commute, and with that, you will get some phase factor. And uh, at the end, you will be able to write down your um, uh, action like this way. So this is the alphas are the phases. So at each lattice point, then some uh, phase will come and Basically, your uh, 16 um, fermion got distributed into four fermion. Um, and so um, you can cut it up uh, the three and you can keep the one block and that is your, um, that is your, this is the fermion action. Now, remember you have, uh, instead of 16, you have four. So four uh, tests, 16, uh, instead of 16 pions, uh, so you have to get the only the one Goldstone boson and uh, among the four um, fermion, they will be mixing, and then mixing, um, so because these four fermions will be the same mass. So instead of flavor, they call it taste. Uh, these four fermion will uh, mix with each other, and uh, you have to see whether you can get rid of that uh, mixing as much as possible. And there, are, so you can add higher order term to get rid of those mixing. Um, and people try it, that also a lot to get rid of um, these taste breaking terms. Now, this fermion um, has interesting properties that uh, not the U4 by U4, but it has the U1 by U1 symmetry. Uh, so all, um, the U4, U4 is not there, but U1, U1 is there. And so it protects the uh, quark mass from additive renormalization. That was uh, there earlier for um, uh, Wilson fermion. So, uh, so chiral symmetry, there is a chiral property. You can go to the chiral properties. Um, but the problem is here, the, instead of one fermion, there is four fermions there. So these four flavors, one flavor needs square rooting, and there is a, uh, how to get this square rooting is not settling, is not settled yet. And maybe uh, they're breaking locality also, we don't know. Um, but um, this action is also hugely used, particularly in the in US, um, and lots of results have been produced using, using this action. Here I summarized all the action together that people are currently using on, um, these are these are the accent, these are the advantages and the disadvantages. So the Wilson action, as I told earlier, this is, um, breaks chiral symmetry, order of error, additive mass renormalization. So these are the problem. But um, people use it because it's computationally, computationally fast. Um, I mean, some properties of the masses we will be able to get uh, in a good way. And then, um, in order to get rid of these order of error, you can add 
term by term on uh, extra term the dimensional uh, to get rid of the dimensional five operator you will add that and maybe a new term and with that you, you, there is another action called the clover action and that also computationally reasonably fast uh, slower than this but computationally reasonably fast and it breaks chiral symmetry of course and then operator improvement is necessary um, but order of there is no order of a term and then twisted mass term there is another variety of uh, Wilson type action so with a flavor rotation uh, dependent chiral flavor dependent chiral rotation so it breaks the uh, chiral symmetry um, and also the isospin breaking so the problem is that it breaks the isospin so you will not be able to get <coughs> isospin properties of those, those particles I have shown you earlier it is also computationally fast Staggered, I discussed. So, there's a fourth root problem, test breaking problem. And uh, the one main problem is the complication of the operator construction. Remember, there is lots of four gamma matrices are there. So, they and there is a phase is there. So, you, when you write down a gauge invariant operator, you have to make sure that um, to preserve all those symmetries. So, it is difficult to write down the complicated operator there, but it is computationally fast. So, with the staggered, they people used other um, higher order terms uh, to suppress. Um, suppress the um, test breaking and uh, that is highly improved staggered and so it has it is slower than um, staggered but it is reasonably fast and it's lesser test breaking <coughs> it has um, again the fourth routing problem and uh, also the complication in the operator construction then the these two actions are uh, chiral symmetric um, i think in uh, um, these workshop you will heard a lot about that probably uh, so, um, domain, there are two types of action, domain wall, so it has improved chiral symmetry. I'm not going to discuss anything on that. Um, probably Kaplan will discuss some of these. And this is uh, their um, problem, they are not ultra local and they're computationally very expensive. And overlap has exact chiral symmetry and it is also not ultra local and it is computationally extremely um, costly. So, these are the actions people are use, using for lattice gauge theories. Um, Lit. There are some varieties here and there, but these are the main accents. Okay, <clears throat> now um, the introduction part um, I have done, I will show now lots of results. Uh, this is just to show um, the people who are not from the lattice community that we are doing um, some good work in this area. So, um, I told you the continuum limit a tends to zero, um, na fixed, and infinite volume um, na, so lattice volume, keeping the lattice volume. Mm, Na, so it goes to infinity in the infinite volume, and continuum limit you fixed a volume and then go to mm, lattice spacing tends to zero. And the typical values people are using now, I mean, let's say 0.15 to 0 0.04 for me. There's a large range of quark masses, and uh, below going to there, there is a problem. Uh, we don't understand what's going on. Um, so there's a problem going even below, and it's hugely expensive. But also, there is a problem, and. Uh, Volume we are using maybe so let's say two Fermi to about six Fermi, and some people have calculated now eight Fermi boxes also. So the as I told you, the input parameters, the lattice spacing, and lattice those can be obtained, let's say, from some heavy meson spectrum or static quark potential, or let's say m omega mass. Um, we have to see which masses can give reasonably well stable um, lattice spacing. So some of these can be used, and then the quark masses. The quark masses, uh, like you have light quark masses and the strange charm bottom. Um, light quark masses can be obtained from m pi or m rho, um, and the strange quark masses can be obtained from a kion um, or some fictitious uh, pseudoscalar mass. Um, and charm quark mass can be obtained from the spin average mass of um, 1s charmonia. And similarly, bottom quark mass can be upsilon or spin average mass of the um, 1s bottomonia. So uh, you have to forget about these because you are not predicting those. Uh, but using after you got the tuning of those, you will be able to predict others. <coughs> now, so in summary, what do we do? So we put the QCD on the Euclidean time, uh, improved discretization. So we go to lattice QCD, and then input parameter lattice spacing quarks masses. We put the theory on the computer, and then take the continuum limit, chiral limit, finite volume extrapolation or interpolation because we can go now below the chiral limit also <clears throat> and the huge amount of um, algorithmic development happened uh, during this uh, how to put this thing here and uh, the output will be the spectra matrix elements scattering lengths thermodynamic properties and the background structure um, many things and that can um, match with the experiment so there will be some post-diction 
and there will be some predictions and uh, so we have to see whether uh, this is really working or not and that can help also uh, the lattice result can help also uh, models because remember we can put any quark masses so quark mass is the bare parameter we can put any quark masses we don't have to just put um, this one you can put any any uh, <coughs> massive quark mass or less massive quark mass between all these so between s to c we can put some masses c to b we can put some masses and uh, that will help um, to get um, better models okay so um, so lattice we are uh, going back again so we are calculating so these are the various uh, sites we are calculating um, on the lattice, uh, hydron structure, nuclear physics, physics beyond the standard model supersymmetry that we discussed here, and the standard model parameters, um, lots of theoretical developments also happening that will be also discussed here. Uh, we can get to some background structure and the weak decays matrix element and uh, non zero temperature and density. <coughs> okay, now I'll show some of the results that lattice people got. Oh, so before that, I will show that how to get these observables. So, we, I discussed that. Um, we can get it, but how to get that observables? Again, that is coming from the statistical mechanical correlation functions. So this is our um, observables. So we wrote down in terms of the partition function, um, the path integral this way. Now let's go to lattice now. So let's uh, think about a lattice of 10 to the 4 uh, size lattice. So this had, we, we wrote our um, action in terms of this bracket. So we have these four uh, gauge links. So this is the SU3 matrices. And so let's say 10 to the four lattice. So this number of sites. And uh, so this number of links, uh, 40,000 links. And then <coughs> each links has this SU3 matrix, the eight gluons. So you have this dimensional 3,200,000 dimensional integral. Now if you take two points, let's say this point to this point, and you want to just do a crude integration. Um, so it, this will be number of terms. Remember the age of the universe is 10 to the 27 nanoseconds. So you will not be able to do any feasible computer. So what should we do? So this large number of degrees of freedom immediately tells us that we don't do the integration directly. So we have to do the Monte Carlo way. Um, so you don't, um, so remember your partisan function, uh, sorry, your observables are written down um, like this way. So there is a weight here. So if you can, like in a, you do the Gaussian integration in computer, you generate a probability distribution of the Gaussian um, random numbers. Um, and then similarly, if you know how to generate this uh, probability distribution of, of these, so this probability distribution, if you know how to generate it, then you will be able to do this integration. So uh, we do this in the Monte Carlo method. Um, I'll, I'm not going to discuss anything on that, but um, during this workshop, I think um, we can talk with the students who wants to know what is the algorithms goes behind this. Um, so after that, uh, so this each configuration will be a, like a path, and so you will you sum about many many paths, and only paths which are the weights are high will contribute. So at the end, you, so these are the gauge fields, and you will be able to get. Uh, for each, each gauge configuration, you will be measured the observable and then summed over all the observable, summed over all the gauge configuration. So of course, this is a numerical, so there will be error bar. So you have to reduce the error as much as possible. So an error will go on our, of course, no one of our root end configurations. Uh, so number of configuration more is the better um, result. But of course, uh, if you get good operator, that will give, give you the good signals. So um, right now, um, the that is community mainly uh, these algorithms, rational hybrid Monte Carlo algorithm people use. So it is currently used by lots of uh, people. Um, and uh, I mean, I think uh, if students are interested, um, one of us or many of us can help them to know a little bit about this. So uh, this is, uh, remember we have a Fermi matrix which is like a million by million uh, matrix. We have to evaluate it and that can be evaluated. The determinant of that, that can be evaluated through a rational approximation. And many supercomputers throughout the world is using um, that method to calculate uh, these path these configurations. And uh, since this is a computational uh, thing, so, the, so you have to do this probability distribution, uh, then lots of mathematicians uh, can also help us uh, to do these things. Um, so there is a uh, uh, combination of works by um, many people. OK, now I'll show how to calculate this uh, correlator. Let's say this is my lattice, and uh, I want to create, uh, let's say, proton mass. I want to calculate the proton mass. What should I do? So 
I have to first find out an operator which can create the proton from the vacuum. So let's say this is QCD vacuum, and from the, I have to find out an operator which can, uh, when I hit the vacuum, it generate um, the proton with the quantum number one up plus. So it has three quark fields. So and that operator has to be gauge invariant. Um, uh, otherwise, at the end, you will um, you will get something the colored states, and we don't want colored states. So that's why you want gauge invariant operators. And you can show that if you put uh, non gauge invariant operators, so that at the end it will be expectation values of them will be zero. So that also showing that uh, it is confining. <clears throat> now this is an operator. Let's say I'm not telling what is the operator, and then at other point I will annihilate it, and I will follow the um, how in Euclidean times they are propagating. So let's say these are the three propagators they're propagating, and I'm not telling you what are those propagators, but let's say these are the propagators going through, and I will calculate the correlation function from source to sink, and I will see how these correlation functions actually propagating in Euclidean time. <clears throat> so what are these propagators? Uh, propagators are basically, let's say, the, uh, this is the action, this is M inverse, I have to get it, and uh, this, M, this matrix is basically million by million, so I have to invert it to get this propagator, and this is a large um, parse matrix, and it's a parse matrix, um, but um, size is very large, so you have to get the invert of that, uh, but fortunately for the translational invariance, you don't have to calculate from each point to each point uh, for calculating the masses. Uh, where um, the disconnected uh, diagrams are not involved, disconnected diagram where, uh, like, uh, if you just don't worry about too much of these, uh, then um, uh, you'll be able to use the, uh, just the one point to other points, or just fix one point and the other points together, then you, you don't have to invert whole matrix. So there is a conjugate gradient algorithm to um, do that, but there are other also many other algorithms for Hermitian positive definite matrix, that is a good algorithm. So um, lots of effort goes on to how to get these propagators also. <coughs> now, uh, we started with this. We created the proton field here, and we annihilate it here, and we'll see how they're going. Now, when you create proton, we not only we created proton, but we also created all the particles with a half plus um, quantum number, so like proton excited states. So they will propagate, and at the end, um, one can show that, so this is your uh, evolution function, you can calculate the correlation function, you put the equal um, uh, states, then uh, you will be able to show that at the end, larger time slice, only um, the ground state dominates. The, if the ground state and the next excited state is a little bit away, so only the ground state will dom dominate. Uh, I mean, this is, student can do this calculation very easily. Uh, so only um, ground state can dominate. So at the end, I will get the proton, and maybe there are proton excited states are there. So if you plot that, oh, oh, so I will uh, measure this quantity in not only one gauge configuration, for many configurations. So I'll, many configurations, I will calculate this, uh, this uh, three point, uh, two-point function. And then at the end, if I see that, I will be able to get uh, this type of correlation function. So here I showed for pi pion, not for proton. This is pion interpreting field, so pion getting from the vacuum and annihilating at some other point, and that will be going like an exponential function. Um, and following like this, this type of exponential, you will be able to see that this is really happening. <clears throat> now, at each point, there will be Gaussian distribution, you can show that, and you, you can fit in a chi-square fitting, so this is your correlation. So you can take the log of that, um, take the ratio and log of that, then you can extract out the masses. Um, so this is this called lattice. You will call the effective masses. So if you plot this one, this, this looks like that. This is the real data. This looks like that. So you can see that the mass of that particle is like lattice unit, like this. Um, but rather doing that, this is just to show that mass is saturating at the end, and you can do the chi-square fitting because, and then you will be able to get uh, the masses of this particle by fitting that. So this is the dimensional list mass, and this is the integer time slices. And, um, and remember, we put some input parameter to get this mass. So if you know the lattice unit, then you will be able to calculate what is the value of MA. So, <clears throat> um, but as I told you, there are, these are the uh, discretized calculation. There are a lot of systematic involved. So what is the systematic? First systematic is um, the chiral. We have to do the chiral extra, part, uh, extrapolation. So we calculate, so these are the input parameter. We calculate, let's say, at some, Fictity has some quark mass, some heavy quark mass, some um, this mass of this particle. Then we reduce the quark mass, so we can put any quark mass. So we can put lot of other quark masses, 
and then uh, we will be able to if you are lower enough we will be able to go to the chiral limit by then at this point we can take help from the chiral perturbation theory and nowadays um, even people can go simulate at the physical point so chiral perturbation theory theory for those things is not actually really necessary now you calculate this thing for one um, uh, let's say one volume and one lattice spacing and then you this is your one, that one volume one lattice spacing this is your um, quantity and that is let's say this is here and then you repeat this calculation for all many lattice spacings and then after doing the lattice spacing uh, you will be able to get the um, continuum limit here so once you get the continuum limit so this is for one volume so you have to repeat that with the many other volumes and um, if it saturates like the if, um, then the volume is large enough you can, you can see that this is saturating so this is your will be the final value so that's why the lattice calculation takes enormous amount of effort because you have to repeat this thing once and you have to calculate the, all the systematics, you have to repeat all, all of these and finally you will get this final value. Uh, so that's why it takes a huge amount of uh, time uh, to get a um, result. Okay, so with that I will show you now the um, results that uh, people have obtained. Um, so, um, I mean, I guess all of you have seen these results. This is um, what is plotted here uh, is the mass of different uh, the particles that I showed you in the first um, baryon meson table, uh, some of those. So here the input parameters are pion and kaon, like the strange mass, strange mass was tuned from the kaon, light masses are uh, tuned from the pi, and then with that you predicted all of these. And you can, and here the systematic are, uh, all the systematic that I mentioned here, all are in control. So with that, uh, they were able to get um, the most dictated um, all the masses, uh, many masses. So this is a, a tremendous achievement because it shows that um, we'll be able, the QCD is working fine, we'll be able to uh, calculate the physical observable, and with that maybe we'll be able to uh, even predict many other masses or other properties. Over the year, I mean, many other groups are also calculated, so these are some of the results from PDG. Um, here, interesting thing is that uh, the experiment is red, uh, fixed parameters is green, and then there is a prediction in the blue. There are some of the prediction, like say, this BC uh, particle, they are predicted before the experiment. Um, the BC actually predicted before the experiment, it is bang on there. Uh, so, um, similarly, the other, some of the particles are also predicted. So, um, it is good to see all these things. <coughs> um, so I told about um, only the ground state masses, but in the table I showed you earlier, there are a huge number of other particles. So you have to calculate the all other particles. There is a group called Hadron Head Spec Collaboration. So uh, I'm a member of that collaboration also. I mean, uh, we calculate lots of uh, and particle masses and their excited states also. So these are the quantum number of the states and various excited states. So these are this is like a nucleon and the nucleon excited state, all the states. Um, but here, uh, volume is uh, not physical, also the pion mass is not physical, but this is just to show that the method is working and when one can one uh, are able to uh, control the systematic, maybe we will be able to reproduce also that particle uh, data book table. Okay, uh, so the, the theory is predicting power. So uh, as, a, as an example, I will show you one result. So recently, uh, probably some of you have heard that there are uh, omega C baryon um, five of them actually discovered um, on um, last, uh, last year and so these are the experimental results, so these are the masses of these particles, there's experimental result, the five of them, uh, so the ground state was known and these, these, um, these was also known and these states uh, had been found out um, last year. Actually 2012 and 13 we calculated um, some of these states um, and uh, predicted the states would be like these. And you can see that at least there is some pattern, order of pattern, are, we predicted also some of the five states here, so their order of pattern is quite good. Um, so this shows that uh, uh, we can predict the, some of the states also. And there is another state, is uh, uh, Cascade CC, the doubly charm um, baryon. Uh, this has been um, discovered also last year, and many lattice groups, not only us, many lattice groups also calculated uh, that things and they're bang on there. Um, we can uh, predict many other states. Uh, for example, let's say this is a triply charm baryon has not been discovered yet, um, but uh, mass is uh, pretty high, uh, 6 GeV, 7 GeV. But with that, with that, we can calculate the masses in the range of 6 GeV mass um, uh, with all the systematic we can control 10 MeV. Uh, so that's a, a good uh, thing from the lattice QCD. 
Now I told you that uh, there is um, uh, these resonances are there, but the resonances are not the pole of the masses, so they are the width. So lattice can lattice people should be able to calculate that one also. There is a problem. I'm not going to discuss that, but I will just show you the result that the lattice people recently are able to calculate the width of the particles. And the, this is the phase shift, which is related to the width. The phase shift they calculate for rho. This is unphysical quantities, but it can show that there is a phase shift. You know that a resonance point. Um, there will be a huge change of the phase shift. So this phase shift is happening really. Um, since this is not physical, this is also not physical. But if you go control the systematic and go to the physical and the shape of this thing will be uh, also same, similar. Um, uh, people are able to calculate the static quark potential. The result is from a um, lot of time earlier, but it shows that there is a confining potential and um, maybe there is a mass gap um, is surely visible there. And if you can calculate the um, action density, so you can show that there is action density to quark and anti-quark pair is going high and then you will be able to calculate um, these um, confining factor. Uh, the global mass people have calculated. Uh, so these are the quantum number of blue balls. Um, and this is the lowest blue ball in terms of this GV. And there are various blue balls um, are calculated. I was also involved in that calculation. And um, we, uh, yeah, this is just the SU3 for, um, with the quarks uh, is very difficult to get because of the mixing. The strong coupling constant, I'm not going to discuss that. Now, uh, decay constant, various decay constant people have calculated on the lattice. Uh, remember, we want to study the properties, the interaction of those particles also. So how the decay constant are, uh, can calculate. So we have these, let's say, um, some particle we're uh, getting from the vacuum. And um, we put a current. Um, so this is like a, it, 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 this is like axial current. Uh, it, create this particle and one, one can relate that things and from there you can be able to calculate the decay constant. And the decay constant are inherently related to the uh, CK matrix element like we calculate say this is the experimental thing and the decay constant uh, are involved here and once you know the decay constant uh, because this factor, this factor you can calculate and once you know the decay constant you will be able to get the um, this CK matrix element and uh, using various type of decay constant one can get this type of um, uh, CK matrix element. <coughs> and uh, again, not for all decay constant, but for uh, uh, transition also, if you can interact through the current uh, with the transition, let's say B2 pi L nu, like this type of transition, you'll be able to get uh, the um, other uh, matrix, uh, other CK matrices. Like this is your experimental things, and there is some known part, there is a CK factors, and there's a hadronic matrix element. The hadronic, that is, people can give the hadronic matrix element, and the experimental thing is known, so then you will be able to get the CK factors. Then you can uh, calculate it on standard model and see those are matching or not. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, USQCD actually, they uh, forecasted uh, like the CK matrix element, some of these transitions like these even below percent level by 2020. And some of them actually is going in a very good way to getting this transition matrix element. We'll be able to get us the result for the CK matrix. Okay, uh, uh, three, so for that we have to calculate the three-point function. Three-point function calculation is also pretty easy uh, in the sense that uh, it's like the two-point function, but you put an interaction there and um, to calculate uh, the propagator and there will be um, just a, instead of two point, you three point, and with that you will be able to calculate various uh, transition form factors. For example, electromagnetic scalar, axial, tensor, uh, these form factors will be able to calculate. And uh, recently people have uh, calculated also quark gluon spin, orbital angular momentum um, uh, from uh, from the matrix element on the energy momentum tensor. A uh, lot of people are trying to do GPD, TMDs, PDFs uh, from the lattice and uh, mu and g2, uh, k0, k0 over epsilon, epsilon, epsilon prime, um, those involved with three point function, people are trying it. Now, um, yeah, I have 15, 20 minutes. Um, people are trying to get the nuclear physics from the lattice QCD, the so multivariate states. So one use the potential method. So we calculate the nuclear potential from equal time Bethes orbitary amplitudes. So what they do, you calculate, um, you calculate some Bethes orbitary amplitude. Um, from there, you will be able to get the um, your wave function and put the wave function and get the potential. So um, they they have shown that it is working. And uh, for example, this is the potential they have got for one is zero for nucleon and um, singlet and triplet state. It looks like a potential that we know for nuclear potential. Um, so 
not only for nu nuclear, nuclear, and many other particles, they have calculated uh, this group. There's another group um, at Seattle, uh, they are calculating the NPL crystal, they are calculating through the phase shift. These interact, same type of interaction through the phase shift, they're calculating it. So here, goal is to calculate the multivariant uh, two-point functions, uh, like let's say if you can calculate carbon, uh, all the states or other, ex other uh, massive um, uh, particle, uh, uh, all the, uh, let's say, states. So the problem is that uh, that calculation uh, after sometimes became extreme, uh, almost impossible unless some tricks um, comes out. Um, this group recently started to do some nuclear beta decay matrix element, um, PV fusion, uh, like the reaction mechanism, they're trying to do it. Uh, they're very preliminary state, but they showed that the, some of their methods are working. So this is quite promising. <clears throat> now, um, I'm not going to say that. I will briefly I will mention that there is other sector um, people are calculating. So this is the matter at extreme conditions, the, like the extreme temperature. Um, one can study the early universe, QGP, equation of state, phase diagram, phase transition, critical point, um, which is related to the extreme temperature, maybe extreme density, um, and the extreme magnetic fields. Um, so these things, in principle, um, possible to calculate study through lattice, and here uh, lattice actually uh, made tremendous um, contribution. <clears throat> and one, uh, people are also looking for the uh, contribution to look for dark matter. Okay, uh, so we know this is the phase transition. A lot of people are able to show that uh, this is the, uh, the transition from the early universe uh, to the hadronic phase is going through a crossover, and the crossover temperature is about 155 MeV. Um, that has been demonstrated um, by numerous uh, groups, and then the result is quite solid. Um, so in that, uh, for, this is just for the student. Uh, what we do in the finite temperature? The finite temperature, uh, we know the functional integral, we can write down this way, and here, the temperature is like the, the beta is one over temperature, and you can compactify this way. So this is your uh, time axis. Um, so if you just do the time axis, and the temperature will be one over time. So this way. So you don't have to go to the um, zero temperature things. It's like going to the very large time. But here, a small time correlator, you can calculate it. And once you're uh, able to calculate the correlator, you will be able to get uh, like the energy density um, and other um, variables. Um, so um, again, the temperature is like one over time, um, is like that. Okay, uh, and what, how do you calculate uh, like this uh, confinement or deconfinement, how do you calculate? The quark confinement is that uh, no quarks and gluons in physical spectrum, the physical degrees of freedom are hadrons. And so what operator, order parameter one should use, this is the polyakov loop order parameter one should use. And um, uh, for chiral symmetry breaking, where it is happening, one can use the quark condensate um, so you calculate in the high temperature quark condensate and uh, low temperature quark condensate and then see whether this is happening or not. So um, the, for the student, this polyacal loop definition is this. So you, you, this is your gluon field. So you do the uh, time direction loops, Wilson type loops. So this is a polyacal loop. And uh, so these are, you can show that this is related to the free energy. So this is your free energy. If you get the expectation values of these uh, um, uh, Polyakov loop, um, the gauge invariant Polyakov loop, then you will be able to get um, the free energy. And uh, the, these, these, then it, since it is related to free energy, so that means that confined uh, L equal to so low T, this will be zero. And if you go to the high T, this will be uh, non zero. And people have seen that. So uh, this is um, plots of the um, Polyakov loop here. Uh, as a function of temperature, and here quark condensate uh, as a function of temperature, and there is some, um, by doing the inflection point, one can show that uh, there is a, a deconfinement transition happening, and there is a distortion of chiral symmetry also happening, and uh, so this is about 155 and it's 170 MeV. Uh, various groups are involved in that calculation. <coughs> in TIFR, actually, we are also, um, Tata Institute, we are uh, studying um, the uh, whether there is a critical point exists or not. Uh, but remember, this is finite density problem. It is very hard. I will discuss a little bit on that. But um, we are starting hard to get whether there is a critical point or not. And there will be some talk later um, in this conference on that. Um, lattice QCD and people are trying to track matter. As an example, I, I will just uh, show you that, um, that uh, neutral you know, uh, <coughs> nuclear interaction, um, the matrix element one can write down. So, in terms of the um, scalar matrix, the scalar um, uh, 
form factor. So these QQ bar is scalar fact form factor, but this quantity is not uh, measurable in the experiment, particularly for the strange quark. Uh, for light quark also, this is like the pion, uh, pi nuclear sigma term, and that has, you have to extrapolate from the unphysical chain descent point. So there is a problem. Uh, so you can calculate this thing on the lattice, and then if you can calculate uh, precisely, you will be able to see um, um, uh, give at least um, precise contribution the new uh, some, uh, some part of the uh, Newton or nucleon cross, uh, cross section so <coughs> so um, recently lots of people are interested in the composite dark matter uh, so there are uh, properties of the strong dynamics that uh, I think in this conference you will heard a lot about that um, this, um, and the composite dark matter could be self in interaction or neutral um, the composite uh, the objects are neutral and then uh, may interact with standard mode particles, but uh, I, I just want to show you that there are some activities going on, and it could be a and blue balls, and there could be large NC, large NA barrier hadrons. It doesn't have to be any of those, but um, it could be any of those. And so this is a good playground for lattice gas theories uh, to contribute to the dark matter searches. Uh, one can study the um, one can study the topological structure. Uh, topology on the lattice is uh, very uh, non-trivial. Uh, I'm not going to discuss that, but um, just to show that it is possible to do. Um, actually, uh, right now, since there is a good uh, chiral action, for example, the um, overlap action, uh, their topology is defined very well, and they can be calculated by measuring the zero modes of the overlap action, and some people have tried that, and that's um, interesting. I mean, and we will be able to get some um, QCD vacuum structure um, through that. Now, uh, there is a, uh, a, a, this problem I uh, told you earlier that there is a um, finite density. Um, so if you want to get the properties of, let's say, Newton star or here, we have to calculate um, QCD observable at finite density. So if you put the chemical potential, what it looks like? So this is you put the partisan function and partisan function you write it down but the problem is that at mu equal to zero you can show that the determinant that is coming from the um, remember that your um, your path integral there is a determinant and weight um, is involved with that determinant for mu equal to zero determinant is real so you can do that um, uh, Monte Carlo calculation but if the mu not equal to zero then your determinant is complex, you can, uh, and student can show that easily. Um, I will encourage them to just follow that and uh, show. So this will be complex, um, and since the weight become complex, you will not be able to do the regular Monte Carlo problem, and there is that's called sign problem. And um, I think the Kaplan will discuss some of these things um, in his talks. So uh, that means sign pro uh, this finite density problem is still um, unsolvable in lattice QCD, and I think Soiles will also give a preliminary talk on that. Um, so um, now I, I have to just wrap it up. So I will um, tell that the challenges in lattice gauge theories, this is not an exhaustive view that I think that according to me, maybe these are the some of the challenges. The how to go to the smaller lattice spacing, um, there is a problem of freezing topology. If you go to the lower lattice spacing, the it is extremely difficult to get a new configuration. And that is related to um, the configuration getting stuck in one topological sector, it is not going to the other. And we don't understand why it is going on and what is the remedy of that. Uh, people are trying various methods. Maybe it, there's some solution will come. Uh, we have to go to the bigger volume, um, some faster way, um, um, and with the reasonable computing time. So this is, and if we can figure out this one, then a lot of observable that I talked uh, related to the uh, table, um, the properties of the particles, uh, matrix elements, so that will be, um, so we'll be able to, some, some aspect will be able to compete with the experiment also if you are able to do this thing. Now, uh, I talked about the sign problem, so this is, a, um, I mean, outstanding problem. Uh, we'll talk, uh, you will hear a lot about that in this conference. So the physics of neutron star, QCD phase time, um, diagram, condensed matter, and uh, Kaplan will give a talk on that also. Um, then how to calculate the spectra of multi hadron states in nuclear physics, um, like the carbon with reasonably computed time. Is that ever possible? Or we have to depend on the uh, effective field theory? Uh, so that's a, a challenge. And um, how, then some people recently started to calculate the reactions on the nuclear physics, so whether we will be able to do it or not, precisely, we don't know yet. And um, how to deal with the chiral gauge theories, the Kaplan talk will come, and again, the supersymmetric theories that uh, we will hear a lot in this workshop. What about the computing time? 
how much computer computing time we are actually spending. Let's uh, give some estimate. Um, so we talked about Wilson fermion, and uh, people have calculated that uh, with that the computing time this the lattice spacing goes as if one over a to the power six, and pi and mass uh, go to let's say five six um, optimist way. So that means if we go to 0.5 Fermi to 0.05 Fermi to 0.03 Fermi, how much computing time you need? The huge amount of scaling like enormous. Um, people are the physical point, maybe uh, optimistic, realistic, I, we don't know, one over A4, A6, like these type of things may happen. So still it is a huge computing time going to the continuum limit. Uh, this is a plot um, I got from, um, Akira was talk some years ago. You can see this is lattice spacing and this is the petaflop years. And if you go here, this is small volume, this is a large volume, so it is like wow, it's going on very fast. So we have to figure out how to go to the continuum limit faster. Uh, we're using lots of computers throughout the world and the biggest supercomputer that we are using, and um, this is just for students. Um, and actually in India, we have also one supercomputer recently, a uh, couple of years ago we bought, um, so this is in Hyderabad. Um, so this is the um, computing resources for lattice QCD. That we are using enormous amount of computing time, but we still need more. So this is US QCD, some pet everybody is using petaflop um, in India, we're just catching up with the one petaflop. Um, just to imagine your laptop has um, maybe 100 gigaflop of the order of the multi-cores. So this is tremendous computing power, okay? Uh, now, how much computing power you need? So I, I stole this thing from um, David Richard some talk some years ago. So um, here are the meson uh, and baryon spectrum. Um, I think this is underestimated, this is petaflop. And uh, for, for example, if you get the form factors, the estimation is 100 petaflop, maybe that is overestimated. Um, uh, spectrum, maybe 10 petaflop, um, so but, uh, you can see that how much computing time we need with the current uh, algorithm. So unless we um, improve the algorithm, it will be difficult. <coughs> there are also the transport phenomenon um, is quenched maybe one petaflop, but uh, nuclear spin, um, some of these things, maybe will be one petaflop we'll be able to do, but the phase, phase structure will remain in the 10 petaflop. Remember this is sustained, and uh, those uh, things are, are what I showed you are not sustained. sustained um, we generally get, let's say, 20-30% uh, maximum, so it will be multiplied by that, so it's a huge computing time. Okay, uh, so these lattice fields also related to many other, uh, this is for the student, uh, computing, uh, other areas, like, as I told you, this is a major part goes to the algorithm development, uh, so lots of algorithm can be used to other fields, like the condensed matter um, people, um, condensed matter field. Uh, like the sign problem, spin system, quantum Monte Carlo. So these are the same algorithm one can use for lattice gas theory and um, uh, a condensed matter system could be a, a testing bait um, for um, developing the um, algorithm. Uh, one can use in biophysics also, some people are using in finance. And now the big thing is that the big data science, maybe um, we'll be able to contribute there also uh, because we are dealing with a large amount of data and we're treating the inverse trace determinants. So this will have some contribution. Um, I'm, I'm almost at the end, so this is my conclusion. The lattice QCD holds the key for a QCD-based understanding of the structures and interactions of hadrons um, in a non perturbative way. Um, I showed you that we are getting result, this method is working, and with reasonable computing time and algorithm development, we will be able to do it. And um, lattice QCD with this con improvement of the algorithm and um, uh, also, um, tremendous computing power. Um, we are entering in an era where we can make significant contribution in nuclear and particle physics. I showed you some of the results already. So, with adequate human computer resources, the fundamental problem of QCD will be solved, um, and algorithm software can be used in other fields. So, and this is for the students. Um, like uh, these are the books on lattice QCD, um, and any of them you can read more about it. I just give very, very brief way, um, what is this feel and what we are doing here. Okay. We have time for questions.
कमेंट्स So, what is the status of the uh, nuclear forces now? Uh, people understand the two pion exchange and the wa where this repulsive wall begins. Okay, is it under control or? Yeah. So, um, so there is a core. They demonstrated that there is a core. Now, what are the interaction? Is it, I mean, two-body interaction, three-body interaction? So there you have to. So this is the shape of the potential, but then you have to model it. Like whether um, your question is whether you know about the three-body forces from these. Um, I mean, if you have many of them, not only nuclear, but many of them, uh, presumably it's possible to get some information of the three-body interaction. But yeah, it's not. Um, I think it is not done. Yeah. And you mentioned there are two uh, different ways of approaching this problem. So, yeah. uh, so uh, one can calculate um, the phase shift, uh, the scattering length um, using Lusser method and varieties of other related to Lusser method. And you can calculate the phase shift and one where they get the potential, and from the potential, you can calculate also the phase shift. Yeah. Is there any agreement between the two groups? Uh, I, I I remember vaguely that there were some disagreements in uh, the all methods. that is conference. There is a fight. I don't want to say anything about that. But um, at at least some scattering length they matches, not for more. Uh, I think um, I forgot which one. Some scattering length they match matched. Yeah. I don't know. Yes, you want to say something on that? Even at very heavy pyomasses, there's not agreement as to what channels have bound states or not, uh, which you would think would be one of the easiest questions to settle. So this is it's really something puzzling going on. It's really expensive to calculate multivariate correlation functions. Yeah. I mean, Combinatorics it's, and solves. The exponentially grows up. Yeah, right. Fighting the signal to noise problem is bad. Yeah, if you want to get the deuteron, it's a very challenging energy difference to capture. And precisely, I mean, with the with the precise number. I mean, that's the that's the signal to noise is extremely bad for multivariants. Um, so the effective mass that I showed is quite clean. It's a pion, but if you show the multivariant, you will not believe that that's a signal or not. Uh, I had sort of a curious question. So in your plot, you you showed this figure of how computer time scales, I guess. Yeah, I got This is the Sukhava plot at, from 2008. Yeah, that was 2008. Yeah. So this, is it, is it a bit dated now with all this uh, new I algorithm? Yeah, but I think it improved, not that wall that high here. Yeah. So because we have some experts in the exactly, audience, yeah. I'm just wondering. The factor of m pi you had for the solver, yeah, that's eliminated by using multigrid algorithms. So that, that factor is, is completely gone in principle. But of course, every time you get a new algorithm, you have a problem of programming it efficiently. And so um, one of the problems is that Multi-scale algorithms are in principle better, except for computers don't like to have multi-scale code. So you end up uh, having trouble optimizing. Um, I would say uh, the big, well, everybody has an opinion, but the biggest unsolved problem is that the hybrid Monte Carlo itself is slow. 
And uh, that's really a um, huge challenge if anybody can really come up with a fundamentally new way to evolve the hybrid money, Carlo. I'm, I'm not suggesting I have one, but um, there's a real challenge. With multigrid, what is the power? Is this is this is the thing that you're saying is in the power of A or where is it hidden? Um, yeah, it's yeah the size of the lattice in A. Yeah, I mean you said M pi is gone now, so I mean I, the linear system, the linear system solver, it's gone from the solver, and the solver is inside the hybrid Monte Carlo, right? I see. So, but, so still but, there is some M pi dependence and A dependence still. Well, it's. When you when you evolve the lattice, you have to um, you have a coherence length, and there is a slow um, random walk through that state. So that is a. And, and yeah, that, yeah, that's a. That is your correlation length, right? Yeah, but you have the eigenvalues, and the eigenvalues are going to smaller and smaller. So I mean, but that I thought Rich was saying is solved now. No, just the solver, not the evolution of the gauge field. I mean, even in pure gauge field, where you have no solver, right? You still have to, um, you have to still evolve the gauge field. And that goes slower and slower as you get close to the continuum limit, and even worse because of a cost topology. Formula is not quite correct. I think it's very hard to get a good formula. There's a lot of, yeah. This is, this is not the, like, you try and then what is Scale. I mean, this is the empirical formula, not the uh, coming from something uh, theoretical. It's, people do not usually keep good track of statistical independence of of, um, of lattices. They have a sort of rule of thumb, and they put a factor in. But it actually is a real growing factor. Is multigrid available for all axes? The reason I bring this up is because sometimes uh, when we try to compare uh, in condensed matter system, not in lattice QCD, there is this auxiliary field method that they have, which seems to scale pretty bad compared to HMC. However, they claim that for certain problems, if they tried the HMC, it's terrible. There is at least there is some pre-factor which is much higher. So for example, if they can get something done with their auxiliary field method in a few days, HMC will take a few months, right? But maybe for large system sizes, HMC might win at the end of the day, but maybe we are not even there at that, that scale. So that's... Yeah, so, so they, it's they have... Hamiltonian so is, system, yeah. Yeah, so there is a paper recently, maybe in the last year or so, people, uh, some condensed matter physicists have tried to compare HMC. Of course, their HMC may not be as sophisticated as your HMC, but... They've tried HMC versus auxiliary field method. In some very naive sense, the auxiliary field method is supposed to scale terribly, but still it's much more efficient for that lattices. For small to lattices, the, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, th I think it's generally true, but I agree it hasn't been well explored, is that um, they have good systems, good methods for small lattices, and they often have... And, and this is not small in the sense of 10 cube or 12 cube. They can go to 40 cubes. So these are comparatively large lattices from the perspective of physics, but still. Uh, right. physicists don't like HMC at all. They don't like HMC exactly for this reason. They also tend to think in Hamiltonian language rather than action formalism, and that's just a culture. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry that I went extremely fast, but for the student, I mean, throughout the week, they can talk um, with any of us and what is the, the real thing behind it. Hello. I just had a question about this uh, statements about this topological freezing and so on and so forth as you go to smaller lattice spacing. Can you say more about it? What is happening? What is happening is that um, the inputs of the so um, want to get independent configuration, you have to span all the uh, topological sectors. 
And if you go to the lower uh, lighter um, uh, that is facing, so I think we don't understand why it is getting stuck. Some, so it is not going to one sector to other sector. Um, that means your configuration are not independent. Uh, and you can get rid of that for the using some open boundary conditions. Um, uh, again, that idea actually came from the condensed matter physics, um, open boundary condition. People are trying that, but there are other methods also. Maybe you can. Well, I mean, the, we know that when you go to the continuum limit on a torus, then there's a, um, there's no continuous field just con of you cannot you not cannot go continuously from one topological sector to the other by a continuous change of field values. So it's an infinite barrier. So you know you're going to hit that barrier. Now, on the other hand, there is no <laughs> a topological sector definition in the infinite volume limit. Mm -hmm. OK? The, the problem is that uh, the We are doing that calculation on the finite volume. I mean, no, I, I know. So, but, so there's, one, there's one way. I mean, Lucius suggested this. One thing to do is just go overwhelmingly large volumes where it's not a problem. But of course, large volumes have all these other factors growing. <laughs> OK? So. Um, but but it but it's known that uh, absolute freezing takes place on a torus in the continuum limit, and so the closer we get to the continuum limit, the closer we're going to get freezing. If we are making small changes in the field, so it comes up with this hybrid Monte Carlo. Hybrid Monte Carlo is sort of a differential change in the field. So unless you can do something clever, actually Shailish tries to do this, and you jump literally from one sector to the other by some kind of cluster algorithm and so on, you. It's just an impossibility. But hybrid Monte Carlo is a differential change in the field. Yeah. Yes, you had this nice overview about the different quantities and the accuracy one can reach with lattice QCD calculations. I mean, there was an overview which you showed, and in many of the for the of the observers, you you said that within the next two years, by 2020, one should reach an accuracy which is less than one per mil. Can you elaborate a little bit more what is needed to reach that accuracy? That was the prediction given in 2012 by Fermilab Group. I just yeah, all right. Um, remember the present that was 2012. Uh, yeah, so we are here. Now whether, um, I think some of them probably um, underestimated. Um, but I was, so this was uh, using um, like the SQ tag at that time, but now they are trying to go to um, uh, also um, his action. Maybe some part will be there or some systematic will be within that reach. Um, but we don't know. I mean, I, I cannot say anything that whether they will be reached or not. Um, the computing power um, is there, but again, the lattice spacing, whether, and these accents are not um, chiral, they're, they're accents. So some chiral effect could be there in these transitions, and um, we don't know. Yeah. Want to say something on that? Well, um, essentially, if you want to go below, 1%, you also have to include isospin breaking effects yeah, yeah. and the electromagnetic effects and so on. So, yeah, so they're not completely solved yet. No, sure, absolutely correct. But, uh, only these quantities, not everything. But what the year they systematically are improving, that is correct. Any further questions? Okay. If there are no further questions, let's. Uh